to be a part of it. Um, so I've <coughs> thought a bit more about the prisoner's dilemma. And uh, the really the main idea that sort of motivated this project was to uh, think about the prisoner's dilemma as a tool for uh, uh, highlighting or focusing on the relationship between faith and reason. And the idea was that uh, maybe if reason can't get us to the good of mutual cooperation, faith can. Um, so uh, I thought some more about this, and uh, this is my latest um, uh, sort of uh, thoughts on uh, how faith uh, interacts with a prisoner's dilemma. So um, what I, what I want to do is um, uh, I want to explore the idea that faith can transform a failure of reason into something that can come to be endorsed by reason. Um, so if this thesis is true, I think it provides uh, a clear grounding uh, to the idea that faith has value and also to the idea that faith uh, doesn't conflict with reason. Um, and one of the things that I want to do um, is sort of explore the idea about how, how faith can change uh, one's preferences and then how that um, uh, looks as you run it through different kind of uh, uh, sort of deformations of the prisoner's dilemma. So um, to get uh, the thesis, what I need is I need a case in which reason genuinely fails. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the prisoner's dilemma, where you're in a dilemma with someone you take to be an epistemic peer. Um, and I want to argue in that case that uh, reason fails to deliver a strategy recommendation in that case. Um, and there, as we'll see in a little bit, I mean, there's some really interesting issues there. And, and that thesis itself is rather controversial. Um, and then uh, the second idea is that faith can transform a prisoner's dilemma situation into, one, into a game that rewards mutual cooperation. All right, so I want to start off by talking about the prisoner's dilemma itself. Um, um, the, the dilemma is really a mathematical object. Um, so it's usually introduced uh, by a narrative. And one of the things that I think can be misleading about the prisoner's dilemma when you introduce it by a narrative is the narrative often introduces elements that aren't present in the game itself, right? So if you think about... Um, the original story of uh, you know, two prisoners who are isolated and given a deal of what they're going to do, I mean, it's not unreasonable to think that uh, the effects of their decision are going to be known in the future, which introduces reputation effects, right, which is a different game. It's not a, the prisoner's dilemma right, is a single-shot game, right, and so there are no reputation effects. Right? You're, uh, you're, you're not, in a way, supposed to think of your decision as uh, sort of being known in the future. And the interesting thing about this is, um, in a way, your decision is, isn't uh, known to yourself in the future, right? So Michael uh, Peterson at A&M has this interesting article for cooperation uh, in a prisoner's dilemma, appealing to sort of uh, the tripartite nature of the soul and the fact that different parts of the soul are going to know what you did. It's kind of messed up. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, so Ken Benmore, uh, is, is, uh, pushes this line that you really have to understand the, um, the prisoner's dilemma as a mathematical object and that people generate these crazy arguments for cooperation uh, you know, that depend on just uh, really interesting sort of controversial metaphysical um, ideas. Okay, so anyway, the prisoner's dilemma um, uh, is, is this structure. It's a simultaneous move game, which, which really means that you don't know what the other person's going to do. You have to decide right, independently of uh, uh, knowing what they're going to do. And it's a non-cooperative move game, which means that you, there's no sort of opportunity for uh, binding contracts. The other thing that's sort of relevant with um, um, uh, thinking of it as a mathematical object is you can't think of the actions themselves as having moral valence. And this is one of the things that happens when people talk, label the actions as like cooperation or defection, is you think, oh, well, of course, I want to be a cooperator, right? But then that introduces stuff that's not present. Um, in the uh, in the strict game, okay. So the numbers here in the game uh, represent each player's ordinal preferences, uh, and they proceed from least preferred to most preferred. Right? Ordinal preferences contrast with cardinal preferences. 
with a cardinal preference, right, you can compare the magnitude um, of the preferences. So with a cardinal preference, if, if someone, uh, uh, you know, marks an option with a four and another with two, right, the four is twice as good as the two. But here you just can't do this, right? Okay, so each player has uh, those uh, preferences, and we're assuming that each player is rational. Rationality here is understood in a strategic sense. It's just strategic rationality. It's acting in accord with your preferences, right? So you're always going to uh, choose, right, the, if you're rational, uh, the highest preferred option if it's available. And each player has common knowledge of the game, so there's no sort of feature, right, that one person in the game knows and another person doesn't. And then uh, we can use best response analysis to pick out uh, what's going to happen in this game. Best response analysis is just the Nash uh, equilibrium. And so if you think about um, sort of player, player uh, the first player, player one, uh, their perspective, they have two options, right? They could either uh, sigh or sigh. And you think uh, a player one, you think, well, should, it, should player one sigh? And player one's payoffs are um, to the left. Player two's payoffs are to the right. So player one, if they sigh, they either get a three or a one. And if player two sighs, then player one could do better, right, by doing this other thing. Phi could move from a three to a four. And if uh, player two uh, phi's, player one, right, could do better by moving, uh, by <coughs> fine, moving from a one to a two, right? So um, if I learned how to do it in, in LaTeX, you can mark these things with circles and, you know, um, you can just go and like put a star, right, what uh, the best response is for player one and player two, and it picks out this lower um, uh, right um, uh, uh, box. Now, um, I think really what drives interest in the prisoner's dilemma is the fact that, um, in a way, it's a really simple game to refute Adam Smith's suggestion that the invisible hand is going to achieve right, the best result. Right, because you can see right, by the game that each player, right, their strongly dominant strategy is to phi, and yet they both prefer another outcome. Right? So they prefer this outcome in which uh, they, both get, they both get, their, uh, get a three, which is uh, Pareto superior right, to two, the lower um, um, right box, and it's the uniquely fair Pareto superior outcome, right? So there's a way in which they both know this. And so one of the, um, when the dilemma was introduced in the 60s or 50s, um, there was a lot of literature uh, that was generated trying to figure out how, right, you could get um, reason to recommend mutual cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma. Um, I'm going to maybe talk a little bit about that. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go through this really quick. So it's really important to understand preferences um, when you're thinking about the prisoner's dilemma. So I'm going to use Dan Hausman's uh, notion of preferences. So preferences for him are total subjective comparative evaluations. Um, they're subjective states of a subject that um, have an explanatory role to play. Right? So once you fix um, uh, a person's beliefs, right? beliefs and preferences are going to explain choice. Right, and since we're assuming the players are rational, right, we can predict what uh, they're going to do given their preferences. The other thing that's important to highlight is that preferences are total comparative evaluations. Right? So in ordinary language, we say, well, you know, I'd really prefer a donut, but I'm going to have um, carrots instead. Chris uh, brought me a bag of carrots this morning. Um, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever gotten at conference. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Hausman uh, right, stresses this, and he says, look, you know, when uh, you give a player's preference uh, rankings, it reflects everything that they consider as relevant. Right? So it's not as if you think they're in a game, and then they're going to uh, all of a sudden you know, start thinking about their moral duty and do something other than their most preferred option because they have a moral duty. It should, that should already be reflected right, in their preferences. Um, OK, so, so uh, given the structure of the preferences and the actions uh, that they have, there's a really trivial argument for defection. Right? And the argument goes like this. It's just turn 
uh, the game into a decision problem in which uh, each player knows what the other person's going to do. And they're both going to uh, phi. They're both going to follow their strongly dominant strategy. Right? So that's, that's the basic argument. It's a, uh, Ben Moore um, you know, uh, uh, stresses this a lot. And he says, look, it's almost a tautology right, in a prisoner's dilemma that the players are going to uh, defect. They're going to follow their strongly dominant strategy. And yet what uh, has sort of the enduring interest of the prisoner's dilemma is the fact that uh, each player know, right, that there's this other option that's uh, Pareto uniquely fair and Pareto superior. They just can't sort of get to it, uh, given uh, the game that they find themselves in. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to think about um, what happens to a prisoner's dilemma when uh, you're in a dilemma with someone you take to be an epistemic peer. Um, so uh, this is really quick on what an epistemic peer is. Uh, Gary Gutting introduces the idea, um, an epistemic peer, someone who has a, sort of the same virtues that you do. Tom Kelly extends this to include uh, the idea that you're an epistemic peer with someone on a specific issue, right? And you have the same arguments and evidence, right, that the other person does in addition to the virtue. And then Adam Elga uh, sort of introduces probabilities, right, into the idea of trying to capture what it is uh, to be an epistemic peer. In a way, I'm not really interested in the history of the term. What I'm interested in is uh, you're in a game in which you meet a symmetry condition with a player, right? So the symmetry condition is that uh, you haven't decided what you're going to do. So you don't, you just, it's undecided, like what strategic advice you're going to uh, adopt. But you think the probability, right, that I form a belief to do this thing, right, uh, given deliberation is the same, right, as my peer, right? So uh, just sort of two things. I mean, one way the peer condition could be true <laughs> is if you know with probability one, right, what you and your peer are going to do. And I'm, I'm not thinking about that case. I'm thinking about the case where you just have, haven't deliberated. So you don't know uh, what the other person is going to do. Um, and there's a simplifying assumption that uh, deciding on a strategy in a game is coming to acquire a belief, right? And so this condition doesn't say that you're going to acquire the belief that P. I mean, you could both suspend judgment. It just says the probability right, that you would is the same. All right. And all the slides are on the handout, too, if you um, see that. OK. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm not going to talk about this um, in any detail. But there is an interesting question about whether uh, the, the peer condition that I'm focusing on adds anything to the uh, prisoner's dilemma over and above the assumptions of uh, ideal rationality and common knowledge. And uh, um, if it doesn't, that's, that's fine. My, argu my arguments are going to be similar to some arguments people have given in the literature. The difference between my argument is that I'm not arguing for cooperation. I'm arguing that reason just fails in this case. And so I, so I haven't come across any literature that people actually argue that reason fails in this case. So this would be um, something new uh, that people have said on the prisoner's dilemma. Um, but I do think that um, EP sort of adds the idea that um, um, however me and my peer weight certain rational considerations, it's going to be the same. Right? So there's a question here about like whether um, ideal rationality and common knowledge right, require that all the considerations get weighted the same. Um, OK, so how should you deliberate um, in, uh, in this kind of prisoner slum with your peer? Well, you know that you and your peer have the same probability of selecting uh, identical strategies. Uh, yet you know right, that it's defection is the unique Nash equilibrium. You also know that you and your peer prefer um, the uniquely fair Pareto optimal outcome, this upper left corner. Um, and so, so you think, uh, well, look, if reason were to come to recommend uh, uh, phi, right, then right, reason would acquire right, a new consideration to switch its recommendation. Because right? if reason right, recommends phi, then it's recommending this, like given the symmetry condition, 
it's recommending this to me and my peer, in which case, she th in which case reason would uh, come to acquire new consideration. It would be better if it recommended psi. Now, there's something, something weird here about like um, these counterfactuals and trying to think about like if reason would you know, uh, recommend this thing, then it would acquire a new reason or a new consideration to switch its recommendation. Um, so there's something here I think that's interesting to think about. My thoughts are not settled on this. Um, um, but it seems true to me. Um, so yet if reason were to recommend psi, right, then you'd accept that this is what your peer is going to do. And then given the structure of your preferences in the, peer, in the uh, prisoner's dilemma, right, you're going to do this other thing. You're going to depart, right? So uh, if these claims are true, then I think that um, reason just fails, right, uh, in this peer version. It can't generate a pure strategy recommendation. You might think go to a mixed strategy, flip a coin, but that doesn't seem right either. Um, okay, so, so I want to talk a little bit about the idea of um, reason being moved um, by better outcomes, and just sort of uh, uh, develop this a little bit. So um, Harsani and Sheldon have this interesting book um, arguing that, they're, that the Nash equilibria idea is weak, that we can improve upon it um, to uh, uh, pick out a uniquely rational solution in certain kinds of games with multiple equilibria. So the, the classic game here is a coordination game, which I have down here. So uh, you're in a game, you don't know what, uh, with another player, you don't know what the other person's going to do. All you know is that um, 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 you would like to coordinate, right, your actions. And one is inferior to the other. But if you think about it using best response analysis, best response analysis is going to pick out, right, two equilibria. Um, so do I need to go through this? Okay, so just why would best response analysis pick this out? So you're trying to figure out in the perspective of player one, right, uh, uh, should I fire or sigh? And you think, okay, well, if player two sighs, right, then uh, I'm going to want to um, uh, sigh, right, because I can switch from, right, a zero to a two, right? Uh, but if player two fies, right, I'm going to want to... Uh, uh, five because I can switch from a zero to a one and holding fix that the other player does this thing you have no incentive to unilaterally change right because you know that you can get a better payoff right by um, uh, sort of aligning with the actions of the other person right and the perspective is the same for the other player right so if you're going through and marking with a star like what your best response is to the other players move, right, it's going to pick out the um, upper left and the lower right, all right? Now, both of those are Nash equilibria, but people think, yet, clearly, right, um, the thing to do in this case is to sigh, right? Because you both recognize that this is the more preferred option, right? So if you just are moved by the idea of a Nash equilibria, you would say this game has two rational solutions right, uh, phi or psi, but yet it seems like we can do better. We can say that the uniquely rational solution is to psi in this case because you're moved by payoff dominance, right? So that's um, Hershani and uh, Seldon's uh, idea. Um, so you can't apply that idea directly in uh, the prisoner's dilemma because there's not multiple equilibria, um, but um, uh, I think that you can use in the peer condition, right, um, you can use the payoff dominance of this upper left um, um, box to defeat uh, reason's recommendation for phi, right? So if reason were to recommend phi, right, you think, well, this is a stupid thing for reason to recommend because, right, we do better, right, if reason would re recommend this other thing, all right? And yet, um, um, uh, ben Moore is, is uh, uh, you know, been pushing this line for a while that if reason does recommend psi, then, then it just changes the nature of the game. Um, okay, so, so here's the argument uh, that reason is 
defeated in the peer uh, prisoner's dilemma. So you accept by the peer condition that uh, your peer and you are going to hit on the same strategy. Uh, reason tells you to always use your strongly dominant strategy, yet reason says pick uh, payoff dominant outcomes when they're available. So uh, you should phi from two, and yet you should psi from one and three in the payoff dominance of um, psi psi. So reason tells you to do two incompatible things, and uh, well, too bad reason. So, um, um, so that's the first part, right? And the second part is uh, sort of exploring the idea, can faith right, solve this dilemma way to get to this payoff dominant um, outcome? And so uh, the main question here is whether it's rationally permissible for player one to have faith that player two uh, is going to sigh. Um, and so just really quickly, like what do I mean by uh, faith here, and, and part, of the, part of the project uh, that I had in mind is I didn't want to get uh, into sort of specific analyses of faith. I wanted to just think about what faith does, right? Sort of take an, uh, like operationalize faith, and, and it's the propositional attitude, right, that's directed to unknown actions um, that has a certain uh, telos to it that would enable uh, mutual cooperation to result. Okay, so, so the one thing I am uh, assuming about uh, faith in this case is that player one is, it's not proper to say to player one that he has faith that uh, player two is going to perform this action if he's just going to use this merely for his own ends, you know. So I'm going to have faith that player two is going to do, do the uh, follow his non-dominant strategy so that I can play my dominant strategy so I can achieve my greatest Right outcome. I think that something about faith just doesn't allow uh, for that kind of um, uh, uh, sort of ma manipulation of another person. Um, so one of the things this means is that so if player one right has faith that player two is going to perform this uh, action psi, then that means that player two is going to prefer right to psi right rather than Phi, given knowledge of player player two's right option of psi. Um, all right, so so what this means is that we have to change the game. So the so the dilemma, uh, the game, right, changes to a different game. And the only difference here between the prisoner's dilemma and uh, uh, um, faith, what I'm calling faith game one, is if you look at uh, player one's payoffs, right, they did the order of those has switched, right. So now. Right, uh, player one prefers right to match uh, player two's action, right, rather than uh, departing. And so, what's interesting about this game is that uh, the Nash equilibrium doesn't change, right. So if we just go through and think about like uh, um, what player one is going to do, what player two is going to do. Well, player two's preferences hasn't haven't changed. So player two still has a strongly dominant strategy, right, to phi. Right, so it would be uh, irrational right, for player one to have faith that player two is going to sigh because right, regardless of what player one does, right, player two, uh, the best uh, response, you know, the best thing for player two to do is to phi. Right? Um, so uh, in this faith game two, right, player one's faith is in a stable strategy. Right? And so... Um, uh, it's not rational. And what's interesting is that there's no unilateral change right, in player one's preferences right, that's going to change uh, what player two right, should do, because right? player two just has this strongly dominant strategy um, to fight. Okay. So this is uh, uh, faith game two, right, where you think um, sort of player one's all in right, on faith. So player one is going to uh, sigh, right, regardless of what player two does, right? But here, right, even player one's faith that player two is going to sigh, going to perform this sort of, think of cooperative action, right, conflicts with reason, right? Because again, player two just has strongly dominant strategy to, to phi. All right, so, um, 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 so, so, to avoid like irrational faith or misplaced faith, um, 
player one has to think of player two as undergoing a transformation of preference as well. Um, so um, what's interesting about this is that uh, if you change both of their preferences, right, so that they both prefer to match right, actions to try to achieve the upper left corner, right, uh, you end up with what I'm calling faith game three, in which uh, uh, faith is a stable strategy for both players. So now you think about like what would player one do? Well, um, if player two sighs, player one's going to prefer to do that thing. But if player two fies, um, player one's going to want to fie, and vice versa for uh, player uh, two, right? Um, so you have a coordination game here. In fact, this is a stag hunt. Um, so uh, faith is a stable strategy for both players. Faith gets right better outcomes, right? So it gets this upper left corner where you get uh, mutual cooperation. Um, uh, this game just is a stack hunt. So there's a sense in which like the idea that faith can help in a prisoner's dilemma, right, is it becomes sort of the idea that faith can transform preferences in a way in which you take a prisoner's dilemma and turn it into a stack hunt. Um, uh, now a significant problem with the stack hunt, as probably many of you know, is that um, how do you get players to move from uh, an inferior right, equilibrium to uh, the superior one? And uh, the idea is uh, perhaps faith can help here, right? That faith can be um, uh, sort of a, a, a source of shared um, uh, action in a way you can coordinate on the greater uh, equilibrium. OK, so here are a couple lessons. Um, uh, from thinking about faith in uh, games is that faith can't conflict with reason. Right? It just seems really clear in faith game one and faith game two that if you had faith the other person was going to do this thing, it's just, it's just stupid, right? Um, so, uh, uh, but faith can aim at changing another uh, player's preferences, right, to achieve these benefits of cooperation. Um, and, and there's sort of an interesting, so we've been, I've been looking at single shot games, but in repeat games, right, uh, um, you can think about how faith interacts with other sort of strategic um, uh, recommendations. So uh, in prisoner's dilemmas that are repeat play, a lot of people will play tit for tat, uh, which is a cool strategy because it's cooperative retaliatory and forgiving. So it's, it starts off by cooperating, and it meets cooperation with cooperation. But as soon as it sees defection, it retaliates and defects. But then it's going to uh, meet um, uh, renewed cooperation with cooperation on the next play. Right? So there's this paper I started writing a couple years ago about how um, <laughs> Jesus' instruction to forgive people for their you know, non-cooperative moves in games sort of would fit with strategy recommendations you read in the game theory literature. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I, my thoughts here are not settled. Um, but one of the things that seems clear is that Jesus requires uh, uh, you to uh, uh, um, not always retaliate, right? And so you have to, so tit for tat, one of its problems is that um, uh, it will stay in defection, right, uh, given knowledge of another person's defection, right? And so it seems something like uh, if you're moved by um, uh, this idea that Jesus requires you to forgive um, people for their non-cooperative moves, that uh, uh, you have to uh, meet defection with something other than defection um, every now and then. But at the same time, it doesn't require, like, um, just cooperating all the time. I mean, that's, that's stupid. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, so second lesson. Um, so faith is a virtue which, um, uh, if exercised in prisoner's dilemma situation, can transform the interaction. Um, so what, what I think of someone is this is rational, only if it's rational, to think of the other player's preferences as changing. Um, and so uh, what's sort of interesting about this is that uh, faith uh, isn't, 
rational in these games if it's just a unilateral change in preference. Right? You have to conceive of the other players as preferences undergoing transformation. And so this, I think, uh, is a nice way of looking at the idea that faith, uh, um, um, sort of isolated faith, right, is not rational. That faith is rational only in uh, a community of other individuals of faith. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, okay, so, so that's it. Those are two lessons, so thanks. Well, in the written version, 
Ted, Ted's explicit in saying that faith is a virtue, and so he thinks the subject cannot use it for her own ends. So, if player one has faith that player two will choose Psy, then, as I understand Ted, player one can't use this to boost the payoff for herself while decreasing the payoff for player two. So in the prisoner's dilemma, player one can't choose Phi in light of her fate. And Ted thinks this compels a preference change for player one. Though I'm not totally sure I see why player one can't keep her preferences and simply pick a strategy without using her fate for her own ends. At any rate, this transforms the prisoner's dilemma into faith game one. But in faith game one, Player one is left with an unstable strategy and so wants to further change her preferences. And this takes us from faith game one to faith game two. But according to Ted, to avoid misplaced faith, player one must think of player two as preferring psi to phi, given knowledge of player one's psi. So I, I invite Ted to say more about what misplaced faith is and how this step of the preference transformation goes. I, I don't think I fully followed it. But at any rate, Ted says player one must now represent the situation as laid out in Faith Game 3, which is a stag hunt. And Ted summarizes that he's, he's given an argument that Faith transforms the peer prisoner's dilemma into the stag hunt. And the stag hunt involves a coordination problem of moving from the inferior equilibrium at the bottom right to the superior one, the upper left. And Ted proposes that players can coordinate to the superior, superior equilibrium by having faith in each other. OK, now for my questions. First, does faith in fact fail in the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma and, and fail in such a way that intervention from faith could be helpful? So does reason in fact fail? It will, if we state the two conflicting lines of practical reasoning carefully, I worry that we don't get a failure of reason and, and reason doesn't turn on itself. Instead, we get contradictions. We get a reductio. So if, if the reasoning from payoff dominance is correct, then it's irrational to select phi and rational to select psi. But if the reasoning from strong dominance is correct, it's irrational to select psi and rational to select phi. These strategies cannot be both rational and irrational. So one of the lines of reasoning contains a false assumption. We have a reductio. Well, the prime suspects, what might be the false assumption be? We have EP, the view that payoff dominance selects a uniquely rational equilibrium in games with multiple equilibria, and the view that it's irrational to select a strongly dominated strategy. So it, we have to reject one of these assumptions, it seems, and it doesn't matter which one we reject. My worry is that once we reject one, we no longer have this tension. We no longer have reason to suppose that reason fails in the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma. For all Ted has said, reason can have a clear dictate that may turn on itself. And so intervention from faith isn't required. So the value of faith isn't displayed here by its, its timely assistance, picking up where reason could not. So second question. Suppose reason does indeed fail. Does faith help? It moves players out of the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma by transforming their preferences. But it doesn't help players who remain in the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma. And I don't think we've seen faith help move a player into the stag hunt. So player one's faith may transform her own preferences. And it may require her to understand player two's preferences differently. But that's not to say that player two's preferences do change. If player two also has appropriate faith in player one, then player two's preferences do change, and the game does change to a stag hunt. So mutual faith move the players out of the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma and into the stag hunt. And Ted notes this towards the end of his talk, but I want to make its implications here clear. Ted wanted to explore the value of faith. And strictly speaking, we haven't seen an exploration of the value of faith simpliciter. We've seen an exploration of the value of mutual faith. For all Ted has said, faith simpliciter has no value. And last question, how common is faith? What's its extension? given Ted's views. He seems to place some demanding requirements on faith. In particular, he thinks a subject cannot have faith if the subject uses it for his own ends. 
thinks faith cannot conflict with reason, and he, so he thinks faith requires a stable strategy in a game. And this is, in part, what it, what takes uh, what it takes for faith game one to transform into faith game two. So player one's faith requires him to have a new rational belief about player two's preferences. Uh, so in particular, he's got to believe that player two prefers Psy to player one's Psy. But I don't quite see how player one would get this new rational belief. At the outset, player one had overall reason to believe that player two's preferences were thus and such, and it doesn't seem like player one's gotten any new reason to believe that these preferences have changed. So it seems like a requirement for faith, for player one to have faith in faith game one, doesn't seem that on Ted's views. And you might worry that this will typically prevent the epistemic peer prisoner's dilemma from transforming into a stack method. And maybe that's right, but it's not my point. My point is that if the reasons <coughs> Ted places on faith are right, it looks like faith is pretty rare. And I wonder, if faith is indeed rare on Ted's view, do we find it extensionally adequate? And I leave that to you, Vance. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Matt, for these really nice comments. Um, so um, um, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about them. Um, so these are freeze warnings, right? So. Uh, <laughs> Matt had some really nice comments. Trying to cool the argument off, I want to um, <laughs> look at them. So, so the question is about misplaced faith, and I really don't have anything more to say uh, than um, what I said is in, in the paper. Is like uh, it just seems to me wrong uh, to have faith that someone's going to do something when you know that it conflicts with their strongly dominant strategy. Um, so um, the First freeze warning um, is uh, that practical reason uh, in the peer dilemma um, uh, reaches a contradic contradiction, so you reject one of these assumptions. Um, um, so uh, reason, you know, uh, would do better just by killing off one of these things, um, and and that's right. Uh, but um, I don't think reason can can do this. Uh, so. So EP is just stipulation, right, in this case. And I think there's this genuine conflict uh, between two really compelling uh, principles, um, strong dominance and, uh, uh, and EP. Um, so um, uh, I really think reason just doesn't know what to do, right, uh, in that case. And flipping a coin doesn't seem right. Um, so does faith help? Uh, Matt's right uh, that it doesn't offer any help for those who stay in the uh, peer dilemma, that, that faith here is supposed to have the, the role of transforming uh, preferences. Um, uh, and it doesn't unilaterally right, uh, change right, the game right, to a stack hunt, because that requires you know, uh, the other player's preferences to change as well. And so it really turns out that what's valuable is mutual faith. Right? Isolated faith uh, isn't valuable. But remember, if there's a god, there's always another player. Right, so uh, in a way, uh, um, there's no such thing as as, as isolated faith. Um, okay, so my view of faith isn't existentially adequate, and I'm actually fine with that. Um, so my uh, focus is on strategic interactions, thinking about interpersonal faith. Um, um, so there's lots of different senses of faith that um, I, I'm just not interested in uh, for the purposes of this paper. Um, and I say that uh, S's faith, uh, S's, um, well, faith in another person has to be an equilibrium strategy. Uh, and it uh, seems like otherwise it conflicts with reason, that's bad. Um, so Matt also asked, I think interestingly, whether uh, it's rational for a person to think of their preferences as, as another player's preferences as changing. And I've really given no right reason. Right, I've just said that it's rational only if, right, you can think of another player's uh, uh, preferences as changing, and you might think uh, that um, uh, in the peer case, right, the fact that you're in this dilemma could be uh, a reason for uh, uh, preference transformation, and there's you might think that um, if your preferences change, so that you come to start preferring. 
right, uh, sigh to other players, sigh that this is evidence that your other players, uh, your, the other players' uh, preferences have changed too. But I mean, technically, I just haven't said anything about like what reason a person would have to write about that. All right, so thanks. <laughs>